The Overwatch 2 game director speaks for the first time since the Steam review bombing and, of course, the launch of Invasion, which is the biggest season Overwatch has ever seen. This is going to be a really interesting one, guys. So let's see what he's got to say. <laughs> All right, then, let's do it. Okay, so this is the article. It is up on the Player Overwatch website. It's literally just gone live. I mean, we're jumping on this right away. I mean, it's... I don't know whether you guys can see... Maybe you can see if I do this, but it's uh, 7.03. And it went live at seven. So we're we're hot on this. <laughs> we're straight in. All right, let's see what let's see what he says. So, director's take, looking beyond Overwatch 2 invasion. And I think that actually says a lot, doesn't it? Because we are looking beyond now at the future of the game. We have got the PvE mess out of the way, and we're gonna carry on with the PvP. That's what I get from the title, but will we get that from the uh the game? <laughs> or the blog, I should say, and also the game. I guess that's valid. Anyway, let's move down. Let's see what has been said. So um, Overwatch 2 Invasion launched last week, and it was our biggest season launch ever. True. They released, uh, the release included work from every section of the Overwatch team. Shout out to everyone who worked on the Overwatch content. And also alluding to the fact that it is the biggest update in the, the Overwatch 2's history, because everybody from every department has worked on something which has gone into this. And we've been looking forward to sharing what we built with all of you for a long time. We made big additions to the core PvP game and other features, a new battle pass and a null sector theme that we received great feedback early on. We also launched the first chapter of our story missions and ran a co-op event alongside their release. We've heard from many of our core, there's that word again, core players that the game is in the best state it's ever been. And many have told us that it feels like we're really listening to their feedback and that this season is a culmination of that. It's awesome to hear. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the preamble. That's the introduction. I think it's interesting noting the core PvP game, i.e. Overwatch. <laughs> um, well, I guess Overwatch 2 now. The game, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then going on to note, the uh, our core players think the game's in the best state it's ever been. I mean, it's I, I, th this is the dichotomy with Overwatch, isn't it? Like, on the one hand, you've got the PvP game, which is better than the Overwatch 1 experience for a number of reasons. I know, yes, we've lost an additional tank, um, and, you know, and we ultimately lost access to Overwatch 1, which is not particularly great. However, Overwatch 2 is a better game, right? It is better, and that is a fact, right? If you disagree with me, let me know in the comments below, but whatever. That element of the game, I find very enjoyable, and I find it to be an evolution of what we had. Fair enough, right? Okay, not great that we can't go back and play 6v6 and all of that stuff. That's never going to feel great, but what we've got now, it's all right. So, if you look at me and go, well, I'm a core player of the game. Yeah, yeah I'm happy with that. But I don't, I'm not happy with everything else. That's the problem. <laughs> and, and maybe that's what he's going to get onto in this article. And I think it's really interesting that he's, he's actually said that because I think this is a sentiment which is reflected by most people. It's like, yeah, the game is fun to play. I don't think anyone would come out and go, well, Overwatch is a boring game. It's, it's, it's terrible to play. That's not true. It, I mean, it isn't. You know what I mean? So I get that, you know, and I think we all get that. So let's move down. <laughs> so, uh, Iliari, our newest support hero, was introduced this season. Players have given us a lot of positive feedback about her. Our balanced goal for the release of Iliari was to make sure that she felt strong, but not overpowered at launch. I think we hit that goal. I do as well. I honestly, seriously think this is one of the best heroes they've added to the game. She is so simple, got such a high skill ceiling, she's so fun to play, and you know how to play it straight away. You pick her up, you go, right, my pylon needs to be deployed to heal people. My primary fire does quite a lot of damage, but I've got to aim with it. My alternate fire is a really short range, high, I mean, it's 125 health per second heal. This is massive, but it's really short range. It's only 15 meters, so I've got to get close to people to heal them. But wait, I've got a movement ability, which lets me jump towards fights, and also lets me disengage. And my ultimate is a massive sun blast, which even if you don't want to know what that does, or don't even care, you're still going to fire it at the enemy and try and hit as many of the enemy players as you can. Now, I know this ultimate has got problems with its hitbox. Um, notably, it's absolutely massive, so it's dead easy for Arissa to spin delete it, for Sigma to suck it away, and for like Diva to eat it. Um, so yeah, but whatever, let's go on. <laughs> I think we hit that goal. Iliari is very strong. But some of what helps Iliari, Iliari, I should say, Iliari, Iliari, I always get it wrong because you have to kind of, like, I have to force myself to say it with a bit of an accent. I know most people just say Iliari, but it's Iliari, Iliare, Iliari, something like that. <laughs> I'm terrible for this, but whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, Iliari, I, I kind of want to go, 
Iliari. Iliari, but that sounds like Italian. I don't even know what I'm saying. Iliari, there we go. <laughs> we were to release a damage hero uh, with a... Hang on, what, what have I missed a bit here? Hang on, hang on, hang on. Can you tell I've drank too much coffee before I've recorded this video? Good God. <laughs> were we to release a damage hero with a one-shot ability, we would be a little more careful with their power level. Iliari will enter our ranked mode on Thursday, August the 24th, and we will be making a few adjustments to her by then, most likely to a healing pylon and ultimate. So I've actually got a bit of juice here. So if you come over to <laughs> if you come over to uh, Twitter, um, you will see this post here from Jake Aru. Now, this, um, I'm not going to go into detail on all of this because there's a ton of drama here with contenders and all of that stuff. But the, the takeaway here is this. This is an update from Blizzard, and it says this. Hello, everyone. Largely based on the ongoing community feedback over the last 24 hours, early today there were some last-minute balance adjustments made to Iliari by the dev team that are going to make it into the scheduled OPR patch. Now, that's the, the OPR is the server that the... It's the Overwatch professional realm, I think it's referred to as, but it's basically the Overwatch, um, the client that you use if you're playing any kind of esports, right? These Iliari nerfs are less impactful than previously stated, so we'll be re-enabling Iliari for selection in this week's matches for both NA and EMEA contenders. Now, these were some of the, the nerfs. So let's break this down, because again, this hasn't been actually, like, this isn't, there's no mention of this publicly from Blizzard yet. We had a post from the lead balance dev the other day, which we covered on the channel, uh, on Twitter, again, being very vague, not putting any... Uh, stats and figures out about it this though does include that so uh varuna i hope i've got your name right says this here where the org nerfs that were going to go through but now according to jay karu uh they have been toned back to be less lethal to iliari so these were the changes and these are not now going to go through at least that's how i'm reading that so healing pylon heal decreased from 40 to 30 Recovery time increased from 0 0.8 to 0 0.9. Shields decrease from 75 to 50. And Captive Sun impact and explosion is now blocked by barriers. I agree with that. Don't agree with any of this. Well, maybe the shield reduction, but that seems really heavy. 75 to 50 seems a hell of a lot. This, though, I don't agree with that. Um, impact and explosion is now blocked by barriers. I would agree with that. Sunstruck duration decreased from 7 to 5 seconds. Again, I think it's really easy to stop that. You can literally eat it. You know what I mean? Uh, decrease the duration over which the slow decays from seven to four seconds. So we'll have to wait and see how that actually translates into um, the, the nerfs. Because again, we don't have the details just yet, but we'll get them fairly soon. So yeah, I think Iliari is a fantastic addition to the game. I think in terms of everything I look at for season six, she's by far the best addition. And it's always been the way when Overwatch releases a hero, that is the most hype launch. But I think this one has... Well, Honestly, I think it's been magnified even more so because of the disaster of Lifeweaver's launch. A, a, a pointlessly overcomplex hero that finds it very difficult to find a place in the game who currently is receiving tons of buffs, which may result in him being kind of oppressive going forward. So I hope that doesn't happen. Yet we get Iliari completely the other end of the spectrum. And um, I think just a fantastic hero. But yeah, she's already getting nerfed. Like, it's almost like she's been given no chance to settle into the game. It's like, let's just nerf her. Anyway, let's move on. So, he also goes on to say, we released a new game mode, Flashpoint, with two unique maps this season. While there's been a lot of talk about Iliari and other parts of Overwatch 2 Invasion, we're seeing lower conversation around this mode. This is because, Aaron, you've released too much stuff this season. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy. I'm literally moaning about too much stuff being launched, but you're not going to get focus. Like I said at the top of this video, it's going to be very hard to effectively direct the community's attention when you're just releasing loads of stuff. I mean, that's always going to be the way. Players are busy with the new hero and everything else released this season, so it's understandable. But we still want the mode to be as good as possible, so let us have it. We'd like to know what people like and dislike with Flashpoint so that we can iterate on it. We're also talking about when to bring Flashpoint to ranked, barring any bugs or exploits, we'd like to start ranked matches sooner rather than later. It's actually already out. So you can tell that these posts have been written probably uh, in, you know, at least four or five days ago or so. Um, so, okay, so, okay. Flashpoint is out in ranked right now. You can play it. Positives. Really like the map design. I really like the way that when you get to a different point, there are, they feel very open. They almost feel like sort of King's Row choke points in a way. Like they're more open. 
than um, on other maps, let's say. I don't like being forced through little choke points. It can be kind of frustrating at times. I think this map really uh, gets around that issue. I never feel stuck. There's so many different ways to assault a point. It feels great. Um, again, I like the design of both the maps that we've got so far. Suravasa and New Junk City are really, really cool maps. They, they look great. I mean, Overwatch maps always look great. Um, I don't feel like I'm loading into one. Oh, this is a bad map. They, they feel fun. All the points feel really fun on them. Like, I'm not really... I don't really get massive negative feelings. I enjoy playing the mode. I've been playing a lot of the arcade mode, which is kind of funny because there's no roll uh, limits in the arcade mode. So you tend to always end up with, like, three tanks. <laughs> and it could be like the fight's gone forever. But, um, yeah, pretty good. Uh, in terms of negatives, I think it never feels great when you're running back to a point. And it feels amplified in this game mode. It feels like you're... You're really running back for a long time. I know it depends on where the uh, the point is. Um, but it's almost like you need some sort of speed buff. <laughs> I guess just play Lucio. But I mean, maybe we'll see that. Lucio starts to be the more selected um, support for this role. I don't know. Uh, for this mode, I'm not sure. But yeah, it doesn't feel great when you run back. Um, it can feel a bit weird at times. Like if you're staggered, getting back to the fight, um, it's sort of like... If you're a support and you're against like a good enemy flanker, like a tracer, the tracer will try and camp you and it gets really hard because you don't really know where she's coming from. This can happen with other heroes as well. Widow is surprisingly devastating on this map, I found. Uh, and so is Ash. And a bit. If you've got a hitscan weapon, you're pretty devastated anyway. But I think Widow's really good because of the long sight range, uh, sight lines that are on the map. So it can be kind of difficult with that. Um, but that's like, you know, you get that on other maps as well. So I don't know whether that's too much of a negative. I just feel that right now, the biggest issue I've got is the time it takes to get back to the fight. Can feel like this is really boring. I'm literally taking a minute to run back to the fight. And that's that's not great. I, I want that to be reduced. But apart from that, I'm really enjoying it. And I can't wait to play it in comp where it'll feel a bit more structured instead of me just spamming it in arcade. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's okay. Again, you guys let us know in the comments below. I mean, if they're looking for feedback, maybe they read the comments on this video. Um, although I wouldn't, wouldn't bet your money on it, but whatever. <laughs> Let's move on. So, uh, a big part of this season was the release of our first set of story missions. So, here we go. We're getting into the, the meat now. Which has seen more discussion than any other part of the season. Some of the discussion has been critical, and I'll get to that. But one of the things that I love seeing was the legendary runs that people were streaming online. These missions on legendary are, s are hard, super hard. Most people can't complete them at this difficulty. And those that did had to devise custom strategies and team comps to get past the hardest encounters. If you're a content creator who completed Legendary and you're reading this post, pat yourself on the back, you're great entertainment. I mean, what I'll say is, I, I <laughs> this actually is a really interesting comment because I felt that this was content that was just designed for streamers. I was like, it's so ridiculously hot. Like Legendary, I mean, the, the difficulties before Legendary is, is, is I mean, well, it's expert, is, is hard, like really, really hard. Like you're gonna get one shot quite a lot. You need to know where the enemies spawn. Now, the thing with these PvE modes is the enemies always spawn in the same places. They always spawn in the same amounts. But as you go through the difficulties, they just do more damage and they've got more health. So this means you need focus fire. And as I said in my PvE review of the story missions, you can play with bots on normal and hard and it's fine. But if you stick them on expert, you will lose all the time because the bots will not focus fire the correct enemy units. So when an artillery spawns or uh, a subjugator, this will be the biggest problem. Subjugators killing the NPCs on Toronto. The, the the AI wouldn't deal with them. So you need players. I'm fine with that, right? The problem I've got is I honestly felt little need to go through and even try the legendary um, and, and the expert modes because, number one, I'm not playing it with other people generally. I'm generally just playing in solo queue, which is a not a great experience on these modes. People tend to leave as soon as they die. It's like, well, that's it. I'm out of it. It's almost like they don't get that you can restart the checkpoint if you completely die as a team. Um and this kind of goes back to this point here of, of Aaron basically saying, yeah, it was really cool to see the streamers get together. Well, I mean, newsflash, the streamers are basically top 500 players for the most part, especially if they're full-time Overwatch streamers. And if they're playing together, they've probably already played together before. And it is going to be super fun watching that, right? I'm under no illusions there. But is this really, like, applicable to the player base? Like, I, like my issue with it is the difficulty, it's, it's not... Um, I feel like they've missed a lot with the PvE. I feel like it doesn't feel... And, and, and don't get me wrong, I think they realise this. This is why they've essentially cancelled the PvE development and have basically attached it as a little bonus to battle passes going forward with these story mission packs, I guess, as they're going to be. Um, but, like, you're just shooting glorified training bots for the, the majority of this. And the difficulty is just make them do more damage and have more health. So they just become literal bullet sponges. And you've got to not stand in the instant death attacks. And that's literally it. And 
it's not going to take much effort to get through that. I understand it's going to be difficult, but I think when we look at these other stats here that um, Aaron has put in, um, in terms of people that have actually completed it, it's boring. So people are not going to grind this. I think that's the problem. Like there is no incentive to go, I'm going to keep grinding this because it's like, oh, I've died and the mission is identical again. And you know what I mean? It doesn't, I mean, we can't really compare it to other um, games out there on the market. You, we can't really compare it to other single player games or whatever. So I'm not really going to bother doing that. But I just think that, yeah, PVE, it's just, it's very mediocre. And that's the problem with it. Anyway, it goes on to say, only 1.6 of attempts successfully completed the Goth Gothenburg on Legendary and 0.7% on Toronto were successful. And I'm not surprised by this because Toronto is hard, even on hard, when you've got players on your team that don't understand the subjugators have got to be stopped. And when they're both coming for Reggie and Claire at the same time, it's like, ah, you've got to, you've got to kill them. And that's where a lot of the missions will get failed. Uh, we feel like we learned something. Ooh. We feel like we learned something with the level of difficulty and are excited to apply and expand on it for future co-op content. I mean, yeah, whatever. Okay, so let's get into this. We also launched on Steam last week. And although being review bombed isn't a fun experience, it's been great to see lots of new players jump into Overwatch 2 for the first time. Our goal with Overwatch 2 is to be made as to to being to make the game more accessible than ever for more people than ever before so that last statement you can read it as our goal for overwatch 2 was to target a completely new player base that are playing different games that are more susceptible to <laughs> to uh, free-to-play monetization stratagems that have been deployed in the games that they are currently playing i.e fortnite and we want them to play our game because now they're slightly older and if they played fortnite when it came out in 2017 it's now 2023 you know they're five six years older let's try and capture them in our game and they like these systems so let's rag them into our game this comes at the cost of your existing player base and they get very angry with what you've done with the game and that's what we're seeing happen anyway <laughs> that's my take from that this though right so obviously being the game is review bombed like this is absolutely you cannot like there is no way around this it, it has been review bombed and it's pent up frustration over what Overwatch could have been. It's also pent up frustration over Blizzard and the way it's gone and the way a lot of people feel like it's not the Blizzard it used to be in the past. And when you've cultivated such a massive audience of literally billions of gamers, most likely, I mean, maybe it's a push to say billions, but hundreds of millions of players, let's say, have been uh, played Blizzard games and enjoyed them through the years. Yeah, there's frustration. Then you throw in the, the whole Chinese aspect of it. They can't even play Blizzard games in China anymore so they get frustrated and they're given a public forum to out their frustrations but even though I believe the figures were something like it still would be um what was it like 70 percent negative still or something like that I can't remember the figures that were quoted from the uh, the report from again I've totally forgotten the name of the person who did the report I apologize for that but you guys know you've been watching my content but like yeah there's there's a lot of elements at play here this is the complexity of the issue um and yeah, it's not going to feel great because the game is not the worst game on Steam. There's no way. I mean, it's literally one of the best FPS games you can play right now. So it, it doesn't make any sense, but it's because of other issues. It's because you've got this massive beloved company and you've got this beloved IP and you've got a lot of people frustrated with a lot of elements to do with that. But as he said earlier on in this article, the core PvP, people like that. And they do. I love it. All right, let's move on. Many of the reviews on Steam mention the cancellation of a much larger component of PvE that was announced in 2019 as one of the primary reasons for dissatisfaction with the game. I get that. The announcement was about an ambitious project that we couldn't ultimately deliver. Now, here's the thing with this. I think about this a lot, and I think about what we've experienced in uh, the story mission, and I think about the way the Rio mission is identical to what we played in 2019. However, there are a few notable differences. So in 2019, there was a very rudimentary talent system, which was very basic and kind of boring to play with. And you could only play with a couple of different talents. But as we were told at the time back in 2019, literally at BlizzCon by the devs who were standing right next to us as we were playing through those missions, they said, this is going to be a lot more complicated going forward, right? This is just a proof of concept. And this is essentially all we've got built here for Overwatch 2 that we want you guys to play and give us some feedback on. Then... The next thing is you had a item system. So there were objects you could pick up from chests. The chests would open. They're all animated and everything. You guys can go back and see this on my channel. Like I've literally got a full video of this, like over an hour long, I think it is, of multiple replays through it. And these items were, again, very basic. They would add things like shields, um, 
there was like a, a Discord orb bomb, I believe, and like a freeze bomb grenade and things like that. But that's cool, right? Because that's starting to adapt the way that your heroes play. Again, very basic, but you could see how that system could have been built upon. It might have been really cool. However, the mission itself was kind of boring. And this is the problem, I think, that they realized, guys, shit, what we're making isn't really a standalone game. It isn't really something which is that interesting for players. Yeah, they're going to play it, but are they going to come back to it? Are we going to be able to keep players engaged with this when, guess what, we've already got this massive player base of players who are engaged with the PvP and we've already diverted all of our resources over to PvE. Again, that's another issue. Like, they should never have done that. There should have been two teams. You should have had a PvE team and a PvP. The game should never have stopped updates. You know, we should not have been in a world where there was two, three years of nothing for Overwatch while they messed around with PvP and then we fast forward to this year and they delivered this absolute drivel. I mean, that is a disgrace, really. <laughs> it's a failure of every kind of level of development, management, whatever. That is just not great, right? I hope in the future the story of that will come out because that would be awesome to see. But yeah, just never great. So... We get that, Aaron. You know, this is, this is the new times now. We, we get that. And this is like, this is it. This is like, look, we've got, we've ripped that Band-Aid off. This horrible, festering, postulating wound of, of PVE and what people expected it to be because they wanted a level of Blizzard polish. They wanted that. I mean, Blizzard do PVE great, right? That's what they wanted. And that's what we were not getting here. You could even go as far as to say the PVE in this game not the story, not the cinematics or anything, but the actual gameplay doesn't really feel very Blizzard, does it? Mm. You know, actually, let me go on a rant here. One thing that I was kind of frustrated with is I don't know why they didn't add additional bosses to the other story missions. Yeah, you've got the one boss on Rio, which was kind of cool. Um, but what about the other missions? Where was the boss moment? Like, where was the big, like, you know, some, I mean, surely it would be easy to build, like, look at the skins in the Battle Pass. Um... The Farrah skin, the Cassidy skin, the Anna skin. You could have put one of them in as a boss and surely wrote a custom script and threw them in. That would have been interesting, but I don't know. Okay, so he goes on to say, if we can't turn back the clock, and this, by the way, guys, is the most important... I'm just reading it to make sure before I make that statement. Yeah, it is the most important paragraph in the whole thing. So he says this, if we can't turn back the clock then what can we do? We can keep adding to improving Overwatch 2. That is how we move forward. This means more maps, heroes, game modes, missions, stories, events, cool cosmetics, souvenirs, and features, an ever-expanding, evolving, and improving game. This is the future of Overwatch. I feel like this should be capitalized. <laughs> One where we continually create and innovate on what is making the game great now for the players who are playing now. Now, remember what I said. Overwatch 2 was an attempt to get new players to come and flood to play the game, right? From other games, get the Fortnite Zoomers, get everyone else in to come and play this game. Get them running through the Battle Pass, double, triple our player base, let's go. That's what they tried. That's what they totally failed. So now you've got the game director coming out going, actually, actually, we're going to make a great game for the people who are playing now. Now, sure, there will be people who have been captured by the new free-to-play, but this is what I want to hear. Because this, to me, I think, reading between the lines, is them saying, or at least Aaron saying, you know what? We're going to start servicing our actual players now. We're not going to keep chasing after things that don't exist. We're going to start building what we should have been building all those years ago, and we're going to do it now. That's how I read this. Maybe it's massive copium. You guys let me know in the comments below, but that's how I see that. And I think it's a, it's good that this is out there. I honestly really think this is great that this is out there because there is no other game like this. This is a game that, you know, they need to start working on now to start building it up. And this can be done. You know, look at games like Apex Legends. They had a, you know, obviously a really good launch, but the game dropped away. And then the game slowly built itself back up over time. Update after update after update, servicing the audience it's got. People start to play more of the game. Their friends start playing. That's organic growth instead of chasing the stars for some absolute crazed mega instant growth, which is never going to happen. Especially not with what they delivered at the launch of Overwatch 2, which is quite frankly laughable. And the game still is. Not, it doesn't, the 2 doesn't mean anything. It's still, it's just Overwatch with updates. That's the problem. The PvE is gone. There will be no PvE, really, that's going to ever push the game into that earning its sequel name because we're just going to get story packs at some point in the future for whatever themed battle pass, probably like a Talon battle pass or um, whatever battle pass going forward because um, obviously this is the Null Sector battle pass. He then goes on to say, Overwatch is such a unique game and world when our heroes are all working together to complete an objective, there's really nothing else like it. Jump in, there's more to come. All right, good stuff, Aaron. 
So there is something I do want to jump over to here. You guys can probably see I've got it open. So this is the... Um, let's zoom in on this a little bit. Ooh, not that. Zoom in on this. This is the Steam chart for um, Overwatch 2. Now, the video... I, I last looked at this. I was like... I think it's probably going to get... They'd be disappointed if it doesn't get to 100,000 for the peak. It hasn't got to 100,000. I'm, I'm very surprised by this. And there has been quite a stark drop-off here on Steam. So you can see this graph is trending down. So as the days go by, if, you, if we compare the peaks, right? So the peaks usually uh, around 2 UTC. So obviously we got 71,000 there. And then we go here, we get 67, 61. You can see it's trending down, 58, 53, 50, 48. So it's struggling to retain these players and bring new players in on Steam. That's the disclaimer here. Because obviously... You know the game is most PC players will be on Battle.net. Let's let's be real. Although it's good to have the option to play on um, on on Steam. So what does this mean? Well, I mean this means there's obviously more people have played the game than seventy five thousand people because that's just peak concurrence. So people playing simultaneously. There's probably been hundreds of thousands of people that have downloaded and checked out the game. It was on the front page of Steam for a while, and it's Overwatch, right? It's it is hot news, whatever way you want to look at it. People do want to know about Overwatch. Hey, and if I can check it out on Steam instead of downloading Battle.net, I'll give it a go. People will do that. Um, the issue I've got with this, and I almost see this graph sort of expanding over time, is it only has a chance to go up if an update is interesting. Dear Lord, I should get a drink if I'm going to sit here. <laughs> Keep talking, should I? But whatever. So, yeah, um... How does this go up again? Like, an update comes out. Well, a mid-season balance patch is not going to make any change to this, really. Only a new hero or a new big season will make people flood back to the game. So we, I think we look at this graph again when the next season launches and we see if it goes up, what's the impact? What does it look like? You know, I've said before, I think the way Overwatch has been designed, and I don't agree with this at all, but the way Overwatch 2 has been designed is to almost make you come back at the start of a season, pressure you into spending money on it, you know, get the hero. Oh, you got to pay for it. Oh, you got to do this. You got to do this. Have some cosmetics, whatever. Now it's like, oh, I have story missions as well. You don't want to miss out on them. You better buy them and all that crap, right? Then people just drop off for weeks and it just literally goes in the gutter. And then just before the end of the season, people jump back on because they start seeing news of the next season and think, oh, oh no, I haven't finished my battle pass. Oh no, I best spend some money on my battle pass. This is what the game wants you to do. Oh, I need to spend this. Oh, look, oh, oh, limited time. Oh, all this crap, right? Which I hate. It's just terrible. But then. There's a spike for the next update, and then people we just go around it again. We just go round and round and round. I don't think it should be like that, should it? It should be sustainable. It should be a game that people are constantly logging into play. Um, but this graph seems to indicate that won't be the case. But like I said, we won't be able to tell entirely until the next season update um, with this graph. All right, guys, I'm gonna leave this video at that. Thank you very much for watching. Um, I, again, I think this is a, a really interesting update from Aaron. R really good update, to be honest. And I think there is a message in that, which is basically them saying, look, we are going to start providing a PvP game now. That's where the development effort is going. Yeah, we'll continue doing PvE, but it's just going to be what you're seeing here with minor improvements. Don't expect it to be anything major because it's not going to be. And to be fair, they did try to seed the audience and the community um, with this information for months leading up, well, maybe not months, weeks leading up to the um, launch of the content. But now it's all been over and done with. They knew this was going to be a bad time for them. I'm sure they did. They're through it. The question is, what do they do now? Let's see. All right, guys. Thank you for listening and watching to the video. I've been Stylosa. You can follow me on everything, which is at Stylosa. And I'll catch you lovely, lovely lot on the next one. See you soon.